Okay, so I've got 902. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, we've got many, many people watching this live. So uh, I'm Todd Lewis. I'm the chair of All Things Open. I created the event uh, a number of years ago, maybe nine years ago or so. Been in the open source space for a long time, for more than a decade. I guess that's going on 15 years now, honestly. So I can't believe it's been that long. I used to be the youngest person in the room, and now I'm one of the older people in the room. So it's incredible uh, how that's happened. A lot of you watching can probably relate to that. I didn't think it would ever happen to me, but here I am. But anyway, um, it's great to be with you. We so, so appreciate you being here. And I just wanna say on behalf of the team and volunteers and our speakers and our sponsors, thank you so much and welcome wherever you're joining from. You know, one of the benefits of doing a virtual event is that we truly, everyone can join. People can join from all over the world, which I know is the case here. We were looking at the registration list, thousands and thousands and thousands of people registered. And really you're coming to us from all parts of the planet, all, all over the globe, which is really kind of cool. So again, I know it's a different time for everybody, wherever you happen to be, but welcome, welcome, welcome. We want you to have a great time while you're at the conference. We want you to get value out of it. We want you, we want you to enjoy your experience and uh, we truly hope that that happens. We'll do everything we can to ensure that that does happen. Um, for those of you that have joined us live before, uh, you know this is exactly, almost exactly what you would be seeing if you were here live. Uh, I would be actually, I'm sitting on this stage, I'm at the Raleigh Convention Center and the seats are behind me. We're up on the fourth floor ballrooms. If we were live, these ballrooms would be jammed at this point with about three to 4,000 people. The vibe would be amazing. It would be energy and electricity in this room. Uh, not quite the case this year, but uh, again, uh, things haven't exactly, this is, what, isn't exactly what we had in mind, but this is gonna be amazing. This is again, gonna be fantastic. Uh, I'm going to just talk through a couple of things before we get started. Again, if we were here in person, I would be doing exactly the same thing, right? I'd be on this stage and I'd be holding this piece of paper and I would be going through my announcements to make sure that I hit everything. And frankly, I would have a five hour energy in my hand. Those of you that know me know that would be absolutely true. And I've got a five hour energy right here on the desk with me today. So nothing, everything is the same. Nothing has changed at all. Again, uh, so this is our eighth year. We started All Things Open in 2013. We've seen tremendous growth. And this year, again, it's gonna be the biggest and the best event ever. 200 speakers and two, uh, 200 sessions. Uh, some of those are extended workshops. Some of those are keynote sessions. Some of those are 40, traditional 45 minute conference sessions. And again, this is two days. This is two days of content. So if you're out there and you're joining us today, we certainly hope that you come back tomorrow. A little bit of a, a why. Uh, some of you are joining us for the very first time ever. You've never attended an All Things Open event. You heard about this maybe via social media or a friend or colleague. We have been in the open source space. I personally have, as I said, when I opened 10 to 15 years, I've watched the growth. Uh, going back 10, 15 years, the open source space was completely different, right? It was still viewed as uh, maybe something that only a select few people engaged in and contributed to. It wasn't viewed necessarily as mainstream. Some of you that have only been in the space for you know a short period of time, that might be hard to believe because it's so ubiquitous today. It wasn't always like that. So when I got started, it very much wasn't like that, but I knew something was happening and I very much wanted to start conferences and events uh, to showcase what was going on and what I knew would really impact the world and change the world. And sure enough, fast forward more than a decade later, and that's exactly what has happened. So that's incredibly exciting. Uh, we believe that most of the innovation that we see in technology, the best you know, technology improving is due to the contributions of open source contributors and people in the community crowdsourcing from all over the world. Uh, again, people's contributions within the open source context. We think that that's incredibly exciting and a very, very good thing. So better technology is resulting. And again, in my opinion, in our opinion, we take the position that most of the innovation that you're seeing is a direct result of open source. So we're, that's one reason why we started this. We wanted to showcase a lot of that innovation, a lot of the processes that go into making that possible. We also wanted to um, really present opportunity to people. For me personally, and our team, we feel like open source is a huge source of opportunity. It's a great, it's a gateway, if you will, to opportunity. You can get in and begin to contribute. While contributing, uh, you, can, you can be heard, you can have an immediate impact, but you can also network and make connections, connections that can benefit you now and years into the future. So we really truly believe 
and view open source as a gateway to opportunity. So we use our events as a, as a way to showcase that opportunity and as yet another in-person opportunity uh, to really make that gateway available to as many people as we possibly can. We're big on participation and contribution. From the very beginning, we focused on inclusion and diversity. We want diverse viewpoints and perspectives engaged and contributing to our, our events. Uh, we've done codes of conduct from the very beginning for more than a decade, and we're extremely proud of that. We have one today, by the way, that will be strictly enforced. So uh, in all of our communication, it's the first thing that we always mention, which is our code of conduct. Again, we're extremely proud of it. We're adamant about it, and we expect everyone to adhere. But that is, again, part of our theme, and it's part of what we believe in our principles and sort of our guiding principles. So that's really what All Things Open and what we do is about. That's why we do it. A little history for those of you joining us for the first time. We've seen tremendous growth of this conference. You've maybe by now watched the videos of past events, either from 2019, even the 2020 introduction on the homepage of our virtual platform this year, sort of you know showed the crowd and, and from years past and watched a lot of the engagement and networking uh, that our attendees uh, do at our events. Um, in 2013, we did this event for the very first time. 700 people or so attended. It was pretty amazing. Uh, we still had, um, uh, again, about 700 people in 2013. In 2014, that number increased to 11 or 1,200. In 2015, that number increased uh, to about 16, 1,700. And then in 2017, that number increased to about 3,200 in 2018, the number jumped to 41. And then last year in 2019, the number increased to right at 5,000 people. So those of you that were with us last year in Raleigh, the RTP, which is where we're based, it's home for us, you joined and you attended this event with about 5,000 people. So we're very grateful. We're super, super thankful for the growth. And again, we believe that uh, the fact that we really focus on inclusion and diversity and, and really getting everyone to the table and making sure they do have a place at the table to participate has been a major contributing factor. So we've actually, we're well over that number this year from the number of registrations. And again, we're just very, very excited about that. Very, very thankful. Um, how have we done it? Uh, it's because of our tremendous community. So everyone out there joining us, you might, again, you might be joining for the first time, but uh, chances are you've actually attended one of our events before in person or virtually. We did a virtual event earlier this year. Um, so you're, you're, you're part of our community. We like to say you're part of the family. Uh, but now, if you're joining us for the first time, you're now part of our family. That's the way we view you. We're, we're again, we, while you're here, we want to take care of you. Uh, that's the environment and community that I was raised in, right? The community really embraced you and, and welcomed you and sort of took care of you while you were there, while you were engaging. We try to treat everybody exactly the same. So our community primarily responsible for getting us to this point. And I just wanna thank everyone in our community for your continued support. Again, this year has been different. It's been different on many, many levels and you've stuck with us and you've continued to support us. And for that, I am really, really grateful. Our sponsors, we would not be able to do this without you. I want to thank our sponsors. I would thank you profusely. If you were here, I would either, uh, you know, put my arm around you or give you a great big hug you know, in an in, appropriate way, of course, but I would absolutely do it. We're very, very grateful. Um, I do want to thank our presenting level sponsors for making free tickets available. If you registered, if you're here, chances are you took advantage of the free registration option. Well, that was made available uh, because of our presenting level sponsors. So that would not have been possible without them. And then all of our sponsors, regardless of level, have really contributed to make all of this possible. They're big supporters of the open source community. And I do wanna encourage you while you're here with us to navigate over to the virtual exhibit hall, say thank you, get to know them. They've got people that are there live working those tables and ready to engage with you. So if you could uh, sort of return the favor, right? They've contributed and stepped up to make this possible. And if you could uh, really, you know, again, return the favor and navigate over to them and say hello, that would be greatly appreciated. And all of our speakers, thank you, thank you. We've got four or five right here on this keynote, right here with me live uh, that are getting ready to speak. And then we have about 200 more uh, that are helping to make this possible. We like to say speakers are the show. You are the content. You're the reason that people are here. And uh, again, from the bottom of our hearts and a sincere thank you. You have many events that you could be speaking at. You've gone through the CFP process with us. Everything leading up to this, you've been flexible and understanding, and we greatly appreciate that. We never, ever take that for granted. Event reminders. Again, we do have a code of conduct, okay? So please adhere to that. Check it out. We try to post that. 
uh, very conspicuously and, and, and make that, uh, you know, the lead in all of our communications. So please check that out. Uh, we do have a leaderboard component this year. Uh, that is something new. So we want to try to make it fun while you're on the virtual site. Um, you are accumulating points, so to speak, as you engage in activity while you're on the site. Uh, and then you'll, uh, you can actually click on the trophy icon, I believe, or the leaderboard icon and kind of see where you stack up and the points that you're accumulating. It's just something small. It's something that we wanted to do. Um, that was a little bit different to uh, encourage engagement, encourage activity and things like that. It's just one more thing to kind of, uh, I don't know, to, to, to kind of engage you while you're, while you're on the um, site. Uh, the help desk, uh, there is a help desk. I'm actually gonna get a drink of water here. I know I'm live, but I am gonna get a drink here. Um, the help desk is live as well. If you need help, go to the help desk and um, ask for help. If you need any directions or guidance, we have an ATO team member there that is ready to help you and Six Connects is there with you and ready to help you as well. Uh, speaker follow-up. Um, I do, um, if you want to continue the communication with one of our keynote speakers, you can do so offline. You can ping them via Twitter uh, and things like that. They might make an email address available here. Um, actually, uh, speakers, all of you can embed that in the chat feature if you want, but if you want to engage with a speaker post-event, you can certainly do so. Uh, let's see, uh, this is a two-day event, so by all means, please come back. Again, I know I said that before, but I do want to say it again. And the participation certificate, uh, if you need CEU credit or something like that, you can certainly, um, we can issue you a participation certificate. Because we're virtual, that's one of the upsides and the pros is that we can verify your participation, uh, and we'll certainly do that. So if you want a participation certificate, let us know post-event, just send us subject line, send us an email subject line, that you'd like one, we could produce one for you that you can then forward to the appropriate people. Two last things before we get to our keynotes. Uh, I do wanna ask for your patience and your understanding. Uh, I do want to, uh, again, just, just ask that sincerely of you. You know, this has been different. We're engaging in different activities. We're doing things for the very first time, much like you are. This is a different world. The world is a different place than it was just six months ago and everybody is adjusting accordingly and doing the best they can. So with all that said, absolutely the same goes for us. While you're on the site, you're gonna see uh, some things, you know, maybe not go the way that they should or function properly or the way that you expect them to function. If you would uh, just let us know, we'll address those quickly, I promise. And uh, we're gonna do the best to help you out that we possibly can. And finally, again, thank you. Everybody that knows me, I'm a thank you machine. Uh, and it's because, uh, you know, I've lived long enough to truly appreciate uh, the fact that you're here. Again, we don't take that for granted. You could be anywhere, literally in the world. You could be joining any other virtual event, but you've decided to be here with us today. We never, ever take that for granted. And I do just want to thank you profusely again. I'll probably thank you again, maybe five or six times uh, within this segment, within the keynote block, quite honestly. And again, those that know me personally and have attended our events before know that I absolutely do that. So with all that said, I've got about 914, so we're right on schedule. I do want to go now to our keynote speakers. Um, they're standing by, they've joined us literally from all over the world. Let me tell you a little bit about why we chose our keynote speakers. Um, we chose keynote speakers based on topics. We wanted them to present topics uh, that uh, were widely applicable, that were of interest to a large number of people, but were that impactful, right? Impactful topics really influencing uh, the open source space and influencing technology in general. So that was the criteria. Uh, all of our speakers are world-class individuals. They're true professionals. They've all been great to work with, amazing to work with in the time leading up to the event. So I wanna thank all of our keynote speakers for being with us today. They're amazing individuals and they really do great job. And the talks that they're going to deliver are really, really great. And again, they're joining us from all over the world. That's one of the advantages of going virtual is that you can literally talk to and bring in people from all over the globe. We think that's really cool, it's kind of neat, and we're certainly trying to demonstrate that and engage in that and do that this morning. So what we're gonna do, I'm about to bring in people literally live from all over the globe. So with that, everyone uh, joining this session has looked at your schedule, and you know that Erica Brescia with GitHub, CEO of GitHub is first up. So Erica is here with us live. She's uh, absolutely, uh, she's joining us from the West Coast, I think from the San Francisco, Silicon Valley area of California. Erica, thank you for getting up early. I know that it's early West Coast time. So again, we, I think we've got a couple people uh, certainly in this keynote block joining us from the West Coast. So it's very early. We greatly appreciate that. Erica, I've, we've, we've all admired your work 
uh, with again things that you've done in the past and now in your current role with GitHub. So we're 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 thrilled to have uh, to have you here and thrilled to host you. So a note to our viewers and everyone attending, Erica's talk is going to be recorded. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, shortly I'm going to yield, uh, to turn off my mic and turn off my camera here a little inside baseball and then I'm going to begin to share my screen and play her talk, which again is recorded. Uh, it's an amazing talk. It's it's very well done, as you would expect. And then uh, what will happen is Erica will be live to answer your questions. So if you're watching the talk, you can engage in communication with uh, Erica. We encourage comments, questions. Here's what I want you to do. Um, this is a webinar, right? This is a Zoom webinar. So at the bottom of your screen, you're seeing three options, right? One is Q&A, one is chat, and one is raise your hand. For today's purposes, our keynote block, we're only going to utilize Q&A and chat. Raise your hand. None of our speakers are going to recognize you, and we're not going to enable your audio, which is something you can do in Zoom, but we're not going to do that. So I would ask that if you've got questions and you want to direct them specifically to Erica, that you can do so. Focus on the Q&A feature. And Erica, on your end, I would ask you to focus on Q&A, because here's what happens in chat. So many people are going to be submitting comments and everything in the chat feature, that those are going to stack on top of one another. And chances are your question might be lost, and it's going to be difficult for our speakers to kind of keep up and track questions specific to them. So if you want to pose a question, certainly to Erica here during the first talk and the first recording, uh, please do so. She's live, and she will respond to you directly. Maybe not, she won't be able to get to everybody, but she'll do the best that she can, uh, which we, again, really, really appreciate. So again, focus on Q&A not necessarily on chat, but you know that she's going to be scanning both of them. Okay, so with all of that, with that intro, again, I'm going to disable my microphone and my camera, and I'm going to bring her presentation up and play her recording. So here we go. Hello, thanks for having me, and thanks to everyone joining today. While I miss seeing friends in person, the shift of virtual events has had a huge impact on making conferences like ATO more accessible to folks all over the world. And that's actually pretty relevant about what I'm here to talk to you about today. So let's dive in. The amount of software that we, the human race, will rely on in the coming decades will grow exponentially. Our cars will continue to get smarter. Software will continue to help us diagnose, treat, and even prevent illnesses. It will help us improve the health of our planet as we develop solutions to combat climate change, food shortages, and resource constraints. And behind all of that is the open source community, a community that, of course, many of you watching today are a critical part of. In order to support this growth, to maintain the software that we already have and create the software of the future, we need the open source community to grow too. We need more developers, more maintainers, and more contributors to meet the ever increasing demands for software. It's basically more of, all, more of it all, I guess. And what's amazing is how quickly we're already seeing this happen. So how do we, the existing open source community, support this growth? How do we pave a path for new developers and ensure the innovation and quality of this community continues to grow along with its size? How do we give some of the tireless maintainers out there a much deserved break? To support the continued growth and health of open source, we need to create an open source culture where anyone can be a contributor and grow to be a maintainer. We need to continue to unleash the network effects of every commit, and perhaps most significantly, we need to enable local and global commercial opportunity through open source. First, let's talk about contributors and the importance of open source development as a viable career path. Today, there are over 50 million developers on GitHub. In five years, we expect that number to double. That's 100 million developers who are going to be critical to the acceleration of human progress in the coming decades. They're going to come from all over the world, but especially from developing nations where learning to code and contributing to open source is a path to economic growth and prosperity. This is a map of where in the world contributions on GitHub are happening today. Five years ago, the majority of open source contributions were being made in the Western world. 
Over time, we start to see more and more regions growing in terms of contributors. And now you can see that the epicenter of open source contribution is actually moving away from the Western world. As we move into the future, we see places like India, China, Africa, and Latin America really start to light up. Just check out the map. There is an acceleration happening in open source contributions from outside the Western world, and this is going to intensify over the next five to 10 years. I'm gonna share a stat that still boggles my mind. My son is seven, and in his lifetime, 80% of the world population will reside in Asia and Africa. The developing world is really going to drive a lot of the innovation and progress we're going to see in the next few decades. And the world is gonna be richer, more dynamic, and more inclusive because of this interconnected open source community that we're all continuing to build together. Let's zoom into the impact that open source can have on someone's life. This is Sonia John, a blockchain developer, writer, and speaker in Kenya who recently participated in the GitHub README project. She was 25 when hyperinflation hit South Sudan and she lost her job and 90% of her savings. She felt like she had lost everything and was starting to get desperate. In her own words, she moved to Kenya, bought a cheap laptop and installed Ubuntu because that's what she had heard programmers do and taught herself how to code. She didn't have a degree in computer science or an internship with a software company. She had a laptop and she had determination. The first time someone offered to pay her for a project, she just didn't believe it. But she built a messenger bot, earned her first paycheck as a developer and discovered the enormous opportunity that had opened up to her. Sonia's story is so inspiring. There are brilliant gifted people all over the world right now who haven't unlocked their potential to contribute to open source. As we look ahead to the dramatic rise in software development that is coming in the next five years and beyond, we need to seek out these folks and create a path to open source contribution and in turn, financial opportunity. We need to make it possible for talented developers to have a thriving, successful career in open source, to get paid for their work, to grow their careers and contribute their talent to a space where it has the potential to have enormous impact. I'll share some thoughts on some specific ways that you can help with this a bit later. We've seen what kind of opportunity open source can bring to one person. Let's now flip that and look at this from the other perspective. Let's look at the network effect of a single commit to an open source project. For this example, we picked a commit to TensorFlow in June of 2020. This is a real contribution contributed by a single developer. That commit helps improve TensorFlow, which we know is being used widely around the globe. In the four months that have passed since it was made, more than 4,500 developers from over 100 countries have worked directly on the TensorFlow project. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. Let's now look at all of the projects that have leveraged and directly depend on this version of TensorFlow. That single commit is now included in about 23,500 projects on GitHub, anchored in 137 countries around the world. And so far, it has been included in the work of more than 50,000 developers from 151 countries. The reach of a single commit is incredible. This is a compounding effect of a single contribution. Think about the exponential impact a single developer can have in their career. Multiply that by 100 million and just imagine what this community can do. It honestly gives me goosebumps to think about the magnitude of what can be achieved. I love this example of just what commit can lead to. This is Evan Yu, another maintainer who participated in the GitHub README project. He started an open source project called Vue with the intention of building a simple JavaScript library that he could reference to improve his own efficiency. He never intended to be a full-time open source maintainer, but you can get where this is going. That's exactly what he does today. When he open sourced the project, people started using it. The community adapted his idea, built on it, and ultimately helped it evolve into a thriving global community of maintainers, contributors, and users. One thing I love about Vue is that Evan's vision for the project is to give any user a low barrier of entry, a good foundation, and room to grow. He said that the ideal user is someone who just got into web development, and they are intentionally designing a way for folks to start building without having an understanding of how front-end development actually works. 
It's this mindset that can give, have a huge impact on lowering the barrier of entry for new developers to open source. If you began with the foundation of a single contributor and has evolved to become an integral part of developer workflows, and best of all, it's now fully funded by the community it serves. I told you about Sonia John earlier, and she said something that I think is so insightful. She said, when I'm building solutions and decide to keep them closed, I recognize that this removes an opportunity for somebody else. So most of my work is open source. The potential of the community is absolutely massive, and every project, every commit is a building block that the next 50 million developers will be able to learn from and build on. So we all need to focus on getting more people to that first commit, because of course, that's where it all starts. So we've talked about the impact that open source can have on Sonia and other people's lives, and we've talked about the value of a commit. So let's talk a little bit about money. The growth of open source community has real economic impact. According to the Corn Ferry Institute, demand for skilled workers will outstrip supply in the next 10 years, resulting in a global talent shortage of more than 85.2 million people. If left unchecked, the financial impact of this talent shortage could reach more than 8.4 trillion in unrealized annual revenue by 2030. This is equivalent to the combined GDPs of Germany and Japan. Obviously, these numbers are for a broader group than just developers. This is all skilled workers. But an increasing number of these jobs will require technical fluency, if not straight coding skills. Open source will play a key role in closing this gap, and in doing so has the power to help accelerate emerging economies. Let's take a look at one incredibly inspiring program related to this. Laboratoria is a social entrepreneurship program in Latin America that trains women who have been unable to start careers in web development or UX design. The organization then connects these women with companies and helps them launch a career in tech. Since its inception, Laboratoria has trained over 1,600 women and 78% of them have started technology careers in 17 industries. That kind of success can have a huge impact on a local economy. Here's the story of one woman whose life was changed thanks to Laboratoria. Shireni Azcaraga is from Puebla, Mexico. She had to leave a career in music that she loved. She started walking and training neighbors' dogs to make a living in order to support her family. She applied and was accepted to the Laboratoria training program, where she trained as a UX designer. She's now a web developer who draws on her experience in the arts and in dog training to guide users through a well-orchestrated application experience for the program. I share this story because there are several things that I talked about today that form the bigger picture of the opportunity ahead. We need the next 50 million developers to continue to carry the open source community forward and to create the software we'll all depend on in the future. There is so much untapped talent all over the world and so many people are seeking opportunities to improve their lives through professional achievement, financially, or often both. That talent has the potential to have lasting positive impact, not only on the lives of individuals, but on innovation and economic growth, both locally and more broadly. But to get there, we must continue to remove barriers. In Major League Hacking's most recent hacker census, which is a survey of almost 100,000 collegiate hackathon participants, nearly 62% of respondents said that they had not contributed to open source yet. Among them, close to 92% believe that contributing to open source in the future will be important for their career. The main thing holding them back is that they feel like they don't know how to get started or that they aren't skilled enough. Organizations like Laboratoria and The View Project are doing amazing work bringing more people into tech and open source and lowering the barriers to getting started. There are so many ways that we can all get involved in paving the way for new developers to join the open source community. I picked a few great examples, but this is far from an exhaustive list. Google Summer of Code, which I'm sure virtually all of you have heard of by now, is a program focused on bringing more student developers from around the world to open source. Outreachy organizes three-month paid internships with free and open source software projects for people who are typically underrepresented in those projects. 
Open Collective gives open source projects a transparent way to collect funding and manage their finances. Community Bridge brings together project maintainers, contributors, and users to fund open source projects, improve code security, and boost the size and diversity of open source communities. Of course, at GitHub, we have GitHub Sponsors, which enables companies and individuals to sponsor projects or specific developers, making open source careers possible for contributors. I'd encourage everyone to consider sponsoring an individual or a team that's doing work that's important to you. The Major League Hacking Fellowship provides educational curriculum and practical experience that new developers can put on their resumes right away. Companies can sponsor fellows to work on specific projects within their organization or open source projects in general to help more people enter into careers as developers. These projects and platforms are always seeking supporters, financial sponsors, and mentors to fuel their growth. So I encourage you to get involved in one or more if you're not already, whether that's shining a light on the incredible work that they do, supporting them financially, or acting as a mentor for folks going through their programs. In addition, think about the global nature of the developer community. Build your projects and your communities with the needs of developers around the world in mind. Do you need to change anything for your software to be useful for folks in emerging economies and mobile first markets? What about places without fast internet? What about your community? Is it welcoming to new developers, those from different backgrounds and parts of the world? And of course, how do you think about accessibility to be available and useful for as many folks as possible? I know there's lots of food for thought here and a ton of great talks out there by others on details around building our projects and communities to be more inclusive and accessible. So I encourage you to take a look at those. What started with a small group of academics and researchers back in the 50s and 60s and led to the free software movement in the 80s and the launch of the open source movement in the 90s is now a community of 50 million people whose efforts and contributions have helped define the world as we know it today. Because of you, the pace of new software is blazingly fast with components for almost anything readily available. Because of you, there is an abundance of exceptionally high quality software freely available for everyone to use and to build on. And because of you, people around the world can learn from the vast array of knowledge and best practices shared openly, helping pave the way for new contributors to open source. It took decades to grow the community to this size. With your help in just the next few years, we'll pave the way for the next 50 million developers so that open source can continue to be a key source of innovation, global collaboration, and an engine of human progress. Here's to being 100 million strong. Thanks for all you do, and thanks for being here today. OK, so I think I'm back live. I should be. Erica, thank you. Again, I truly appreciate you being with us. Wonderful talk, great topic. Obviously, it's one we care very much about, and we've been on for a while also. Uh, it's amazing to see that growth. And you're right, the statistic that shocked you, 80% uh, of the world's population uh, will be in those two areas. Uh, when I heard you say that, shocking to me as well. So uh, it's it was a real eye opener. We knew that number was large, but I didn't really realize that it was that large. So thank you. Thanks again for being with us uh, live in the chat. So all of our attendees and everyone uh, that's live with us right now in this session, again, Erica is going to stay with us and continue to engage with you in chat and in QA feature. So if you have a question uh, specifically for Erica, I would encourage you to Again, leverage the Q&A, pose it to her there, and she's gonna you know, be on the lookout for those questions. And she'll also scan chat, but again, chat's tough only because the messages, as you know, they stack on top of each other, it's real time. Uh, so it's a little difficult to follow the conversation there. So we're encouraging everybody with questions, again, one last time to pose those to Erica via the QA feature. So Erica, again, thank you very much. It's early for you, very gracious to join us and wonderful job as always. So with that, and I think these, this next talk segues really nicely 
uh, from, from Erica's talk, really, because the topics are very related. Uh, we've got um, Shedrick Akintayo of the Cloud Foundry Foundation with us. The title of the talk, the title of Shedrick's talk is Open Source in Africa. So again, it really does work well, kind of flows nicely from the talk that Erica just gave. That's why we sequenced them like this. It's why uh, that we placed this one after and following Erica's talk. So Shedrick is uh, one, uh, someone that I referenced earlier, right? Shedrick is joining us live from Africa and we really appreciate him being here. So um, Shedrick, with all of that, uh, again, thank you one last time. We appreciate you and we appreciate you working with us up to this point. You've done a great job. You've been a joy to work with. Very easy. You're a super nice person, by the way. <laughs> You're wonderful to communicate with. And uh, that makes our job, that makes everyone's job much, much easier. But with all that said, I'm going to uh, yield the virtual stage to you now. And I'm going to, I'll do this again. I'm going to disable my microphone and my camera. And if you will enable yours, and then you can begin to screen share and uh, you can share your slides and you can go through your presentation with that. But Shedrick, thank you again. And I'm going to yield it to you and turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Shedrak Akintayo, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, open source in Africa. So let's get started. And thank you once again for allowing me to grace this event. It means a lot to me. So let's get started. So um, like um, Todd said, I'm Shedrak Akintayo, software developer. I'm developer advocate, and I also double as a technical writer. So let's talk about Africa. I mean, Africa is a continent, not a country. Africa is a continent in the world with various countries in it. Africa is quite um, populated, have a large number of black people in Africa. We are about 1.216 billion people as of 2016. I mean, it should be double, it should have increased more by now. Um, talent. So, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of us have been seeing like different things coming out from Africa. And one of Africa's major export resource is talent. We have various talented designers, developers, and engineers. Now, let's 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 go back, take it back a little bit to GitHub State of the Octoverse 2019. Now, if you um look at the chart I'm, I just showed now, um where open source is growing, we have about 59% growth in Nigeria, which is really really um crazy. Um, we also have about 44% growth in Kenya, and we've had um a growth from about 40% in Tunisia and Morocco. And to just show you how much Africa is like. Um, developers from Africa are really doing the whole um, open source. I really take it open source seriously. We can see that Nigeria has the highest um, growth in open source. Nigeria is a country in Africa, my home country. Um, so now let's check out, let's just see a little bit of what um, GitHub is saying about Africa. So we have about 65% growth in Kenya, in Morocco, Kenya, um, Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa. I mean, we, Nigerians, um, the entire Africa is taking um, open source up to the next level, and we've had collectively about 70% more contributors this year than last year, which is like a really insane start for um, open source. Now, let's talk about a certain um, a couple um, a community in Nigeria and Nigeria and Africa that is helping to spread the gospel of open source. Um, Oscar, so open source community Africa. Open source community Africa is like a community of creatives driving the open source movement in Africa. It was basically created to encourage more African developers to contribute to open source and also um, advocate for open source movements in Africa. The most beautiful thing about Oscar is it is, it is diverse. It, um, it provides um, a community for both designers, for both technical writers, for both developers to come together and contribute to open source. Um, so Oscar demographics. Um, just before I move forward, I'm also part of the um, organizing team for um, um, for Oscar. So we are currently in about five countries. Um, we have about 11 cities and a thousand plus members in Africa, and we are about to see more growth in the coming um, months. So these like several photos from um, various meetups that we've had. Um, we've had meetups in Kenya, Zambia. Um, various parts of Africa to talk to, to sit down and talk about open source. Um, so Oscar project. So we had the open source festival. Um, we started the open source festival um, this earlier this year um, in February. And we had like a large number. We have about eight, eight, 800 to 1,000 um, 
people come to coming together from all parts of Africa and also Europe. We had people from Jupa, we had people from um, GitHub, we had people from Google. We also had um, sponsorships from Facebook, Google, GitHub, and it was really, really nice to see people coming together to talk about um, open source here in Africa. We also encourage diversity. Like I said, we also have the women on Oscar, um, which is a joint effort with She Code Africa um, to introduce and train more women and girls into open source. Um, so we also partnered with Oscar, also partnered with Open Collective to create a bounty um, program so that uh, people that are contributing to open source can also get paid here in Africa while contributing. Um, so there's certain a number of bugs that are available on the um, Open Collective um, repo, GitHub repo with um, bounty um, tags on it. You would, if you check it out now, you will see it there called um, with the, um, tag Oscar. And like I said, we um, we have a very diverse community of both developers and designers. So Open Source Design Africa, this is an effort by the design team of Oscar to help designers also get started in contributing to open source. So connecting with Oscar, do you want to know more about Oscar? You can also check the website, oscar.org. You can also follow them on Twitter and also donate to um, Oscar on Open Collective. Now, so while we are um, talking about various communities, we need to talk about certain people that have helped <laughs> grow the, uh, they have helped grow the development, the um, can help grow the, the growth of um, open source in Africa. So like I was, so the very first person I would like to talk about is Samson. So Samson Gaudi is also a GitHub star and part of the GitHub uh, README project is a software developer who believes in changing um, the world and is an open source um, advocate and is also maintaining um, Sugar Labs while uh, on the board of directors seats. Oscar is also the co-founder of the Open Source Africa. Um, Sam is also the co-founder of the Open Source Africa and he currently works with the UN and um, UN women to bring more women into technology. Um, next person is Ada. So Ada, she's the founder of SheCode Africa. Um, she trains girls and brings, um, provides um, a community for girls to learn and women to learn how to write code. Um, she's also the co-founder of um, Open Source Africa. She's also a developer advocate at um, Google. Yeah. So in February 2020, she and her um, team um, hosted about a thousand plus Africa developers oh. to the largest open source Africa um, open source event here in Africa, tagged the Open Source oh. Festival. Like I said, um, oh. the next question is Prosper. So Prosper is an open source advocate, is an evangelist and the CTO of Eden Life Inc. Um, he's one of the pioneers, the key pioneers of open source movement in Africa here. Um, he's a regular speaker um, at developer events around the world. One very insane start that helped Nigeria get recognized as one of the um, people pushing for the open source movement. In 2016, Prosper beat out top companies like Facebook to trend number two on GitHub. Only Google was above him on the list of trend developers. I mean, Google is a whole organization and Prosper is just a single person that was able to top um, other companies like Facebook and et cetera in the list of trending developers, which is like a big win for um, Africa. I think it was during this time that companies outside um, Nigeria, outside Africa began to shift, take a shift towards um, seeing what we are doing here in Africa. The next question is Abigail. So Abigail is a product designer and an open source divine, um, design avocado, an advocate. Um, she has over various years of um, experience, combined experience in technology, focusing on web and product design. She also um, is a speaker here at the Altins Open. Very excited to see her talk. And she loves open source and is passionate about helping people learn how to um, grow as open source contributors. She basically pushes for um, more designers to go into open source and um, if you, if you have noticed over the years, a lot of people think that just pushing op open source is just for developers. But um, Abigail here is trying to um, change the narrative that even designers can contribute to open source. And Marlene, Marlene is a Zimbabwean explorer. She's a speaker, and she's from um, she's from Z um, a city of Harare in Zambia. She's also um, an advocate for social um, for science and technology for social good. She's currently the director and the vice chair for Spy for the Python Software Foundation and also on the chair of Python Africa. She's currently pursuing a computer science degree with the University of London. Marlene has over a very good number of years contributing to open source and also in, um, providing um, com a community for um, developers to get into open source and including designers. Yeah, the next is Shegun Adibayo. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people from um, 
A lot of people from around the world do not know um, Shegun Day Bio is the creator of Chakra UI. So Chakra UI is a very popular React component library that helps um, you create accessible websites and um, apps with speed. Uh, on GitHub, the project is hosted on GitHub. It has about um, 10,000, about over 10,000 um, 10, stars, which is really, really great. And it's one of the biggest projects, um, open source project that's come out of Africa. He's also a design, is a design engineer manager at Tradelink.com. He also co-founded co CareerLift. Um, Shagun is a very, very big open source advocate here in Africa. Um, when he started Chakra UI, um, we've saw we've seen we saw how um, Chakra UI grew from just having um, one star to having over ten thousand stars and having recognitions from all over the world with um, people like um, Kent, um, very big open source players in the world using um, um, Chakra UI and giving very great feedback about it. We are part of him here in Africa, and we are looking so forward to see more stuff, um, more open source projects from him and other people. So notable OM, OM open source projects and communities from Africa. Um, like I said, Chakra UI, um, a very very huge we have component library with a lot of um, people using it all around the world. And we have Image AI. Um, this is like an artificial intelligence um, um, project by um, by Moses. Um, Moses, is a, I think he's currently a um, software engineer at Microsoft here in Nigeria. Um, the project has about 5,000 stars on GitHub we have, and has a lot of people using it. Then down for JS, it's, um, it's a JavaScript library for data structures. For um, exp um for presenting data in um in structures etc. Um, made in Nigeria. So made in Nigeria is a um GitHub repo that consists of all the most of the open source projects that has come out of Nigeria. It's a community of open source developers here in Nigeria and designers here in Nigeria. So, um, we share your projects and you can it's the project is currently hosted on GitHub and you can always like find out and by clicking the link. So I attach the links to every single um. Um, to every single point um, project that I'm dropping here. Um, Code for Africa. So Code for Africa is a community where um, people come together to talk, um, to teach people how to um, code um, from cute children to women to um, just basically if you want to get into um, coding and also open source. Code for Africa is there for Africans. Open source community Africa, like I said, I've I spoke about open source community. Africa is one of the largest open source communities we have here in Africa that is trying to change the narrative of how people see open source here in Africa. So Material P19, um, I purposely put this here because I mean, a lot of people here, we use VS Code and uh, Material P19 was created by Ola Olo Olawi. Um, he's currently a senior UX developer at Shopify. Um, he built it here while in, here in, in Nigeria and it has about 300,000 downloads, which is really, really, um, a very, very good mark for us here in Af um, Africa. It's currently hosted on GitHub and you can always find the link to it. Um, you can use a really, really great team. We had people like Sarah, um, Sarah Drasna. We have people, um, very, very good, um, big players in the open source talk about um, Material Pay Night team and how useful it is. We've had various people make um, certain um, lookalike teams from the Material um, um, Pay Night team. Now the Free Software and Open Source Foundation for Africa. Um, so it's basically headed by the UN and and um, it basically brings people from various parts of Africa to come up and learn more about um, open source and also um, learn more about coding. Now, how to provide um, support for um, OSS in Africa? I think um, Erica said something generally about how to provide support for people in um, open source, uh, but I want to like narrow it down to just Africa. And um, we need more people to sponsor, more companies, more organizations, more um, on foundations to sponsor OSS events in Africa. Currently, we've had just um, we had just Open Source Community Africa pushing this pushing for this event. Uh, we also need to provide um, OSS. We also need these companies and organizations and foundations to provide OSS learning supports for um, people here in Africa. We also need to like, we need more OSS initiative established here in Africa because a lot of people are still like lacking behind when it comes to open source. Um, a lot of people still don't understand what it means. So when um, more initiatives are created for people to see how um, open source work, a lot of people don't understand it, then we will see a better increase um, in open source here in Africa. We need, to, um, we need more people to provide a voice for African OSS creators and contributors. There are a lot of OSS creators and contributors here in Africa doing great stuff um, that, that they are hardly recognized. So um, we need people to, um, help us reach out to these OSS creators and the contributors here in Africa, provide, get them get them on interviews to talk about their products, talk about things they are doing, um, 
it will it will really serve as an in, as an incentive for more people to get into open source because a lot of people feel like they're not appreciated enough because I mean they're Africans but um when we provide the, an enable um, environment for people for OSS creators and contributors then um would have a better increase in um open source de um, contributions here in Africa so one very important is hire more thing is hire more folks from Africa I mean we have great people here that are working that very intelligent, very brilliant. I mean, if, when companies come here to Africa to see that um, we have good people put, um, providing open source support, doing a lot of open source um, contribution, um, you would see that um, this would provide um, a sense of like, okay, this is um, great. So we can co um, currently start um, providing more support for people here in Africa. And this will, see the, this will increase the um, growth of open source here in Africa. I mean, there are a lot of open source companies around the world. So this, is, this isn't this is something that should be that difficult. Um, also, one very, and very last point is promote um, open source from Africa. GitHub has been doing a very um, great job promoting open source here in Africa with the README project. I mean, talking about Sonia, a lot of couple of um, Africans that something down the, um, on Readme project, we have Samsung, we have Sonia, we have like a long number of people from Africa here that GitHub have decided to promote, um, create a voice for them, more people to hear about their story, um, etc. So, um, so yeah, that's basically it for my talk, um, for my keynote talk. Thank you everyone for listening, for taking your time to listen to my talk. Um, this means a lot to me, and thank you to the organizers for um, giving me the opportunity to talk about open source in Africa. I have a talk tomorrow um, on the international track. If you want to hear more about open source in Africa, you can definitely jump on the talk. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference. So thank you very much. It's wonderful to have you. And we really appreciate your, your uh, talk. Again, your, your topic uh, really sort of segued nicely or connected nicely with Erica's um, opening talk topic. Uh, we thought those two worked very, very well together. So we appreciate you joining us. Again, you're live, you're in Africa. And uh, again, uh, virtual communication, a virtual event enables us to do that, but we greatly appreciate it nonetheless. And hopefully next year, who knows, in 2021, we can uh, host you live here in Raleigh in the Research Triangle Park. We would absolutely love to do that. So thank you again. Yeah. And you're exactly right. You are delivering a, a 45 minute talk and basically an extension of this, an expanded version, uh, I think, of, the, of, of this talk or a very similar topic tomorrow on Tuesday. And that's a pretty good reminder to everyone attending that this is a two-day event. So we certainly encourage you to come back tomorrow as well. So with all that said, Shedrick, again, thank you very much. Wonderful job. Great, great job. Thank great, you. great topic. So you bet. Okay, so now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to move to the next topic. And uh, the next uh, topic and uh, our, our speakers will be uh, IBM. Uh, they're going to make uh, a special announcement. Uh, I've got Endu Imache joining me, and I think Endu's in Africa as well. So we're going to stay in Africa, I think, for this segment. And uh, I want to introduce Endu. And what I'm going to do is, uh, once I turn it over, uh, I'm going to, uh, again, disable my microphone and my, and my camera, and I'm going to bring up some slides. And I think Endu is going to speak to some slides, and then he's going to turn it over to Brad Topol uh, with IBM also. So uh, IBM, we're grateful to have them involved. They've been really big players, very important players in the open source community for a long period of time. We've worked with them. We know that because we've worked with them for more than a decade. Uh, I initially uh, noticed their contributions to Watson. Uh, everybody here, most people here have heard of IBM Watson. We knew that a lot of open source went into the building of the infrastructure and really building that product and that platform out. Uh, and so we've been following them again for more than a decade. They've been speaking at our conferences and they've been partners with us for a very long period of time. So it's great to have them back. Uh, they made several announcements at the event last year in 2019. Of course, they did that live from our stage, uh, but uh, this is virtual, but hopefully in 2021, again, uh, we, will, we will have them back live. So with all that said, Indu again, uh, Indu Emiche is joining us from Africa. So Indu, what I'm gonna do, again, just like I did with Shedrick, I'm going to uh, cut my microphone and cut my video, and then I'm gonna begin to share my screen and I'll show your slides on my screen to our attendees and to our audience. Thank you, Todd. Um, hello, I'm Endu Emuche, IBM Fellow, Cloud Transformation and Engineering. I am really delighted to be here to share some important news around how technology can be leveraged to combat racial inequalities. IBM is a founding partner in Call for Code, the largest tech for good initiative of its kind anywhere in the world. It's a successful global program, which for the past three years has been addressing some of the most pressing intractable, 
unprecedented interconnected challenges of our time, including COVID-19, climate change, natural disasters. Leveraging the unique ingenuity of more than 400,000 developers in almost 180 nations around the world. Earlier last week, on October 13th, IBM announced Call for Code for Racial Justice. This encourages adoption, incubation, evolution of open source projects to drive progress in three important areas. First, police and judicial reform and accountability, diverse representation, policy and legislation reform. Today, I'd like to announce that the Call for Code for Racial Justice team is contributing five solution starters to the open source community, really to galvanize, to accelerate that progress towards a more inclusive, equal, equitable world. These five solutions cover topics, including voting, including incident response reporting, local legislation and policies, and assistance to public defenders. Together with partners such as Black Girls Code and Collab Capital, Call for Code for Racial Justice is inviting developers from around the world, all of you on this uh, conference, to apply your skill sets, your ingenuity, your passion to drive meaningful change around equity and equal equality. We believe that the open source collaboration model is such a powerful force that can make this sustained meaningful change happen. Now you can learn more about Call for Code for Racial Justice as well as IBM's perspective on the role of open source technology in diversity and inclusion by attending two sessions today and tomorrow. In one of the sessions, I would actually be a panelist. Uh, in the other, I'll be moderating a panel of experts on this topic. You could also visit the IBM digital booth uh, to learn more. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Brad Topol, to share some additional news and information. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you, Andrew. I'm Brad Topol, IBM's Distinguished Engineer for Open Technology and Developer Advocacy, and I have some very exciting announcements. First, join me tomorrow for my moderated theater presentation at 2.30 p.m., where I will be announcing the Call for Code Regional Award winner and also giving a very fun presentation on Kubernetes, and we'll have uh, two free book links as well. But I do have a big announcement for today, and that is the IBM Open Source Community Grant. The IBM Open Source Community Grant is an effort by IBMers to take action and to have a positive impact on open source by driving efforts to create and sustain a more, a more diverse technology workforce. The grant awards $25,000 in cash and $25,000 in IBM Cloud credits. I had the honor of announcing the first ever IBM Open Source Community Grant Award last year on stage at All Things Open. And we awarded this grant quarterly ever since. Now, for the winner of this quarter's IBM Open Source Community Grant is Black Girls Code. Black Girls Code's mission is to increase the number of women of color in the digital space by empowering girls of color ages seven to 17 to become innovators in STEM fields, leaders in their communities, and builders of their own futures through exposure to computers and technology. IBM is powering their mission with $25,000 in cash and $25,000 of IBM cl cloud credits. We couldn't be happier to help them in their mission. And if you have an open sourced focused nonprofit that, is, that you would like to be under consideration for an IBM open source grant, please contact an IBMer who's working in your open source community to nominate you. And once again, congratulations to Black Girls Code. Brad, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. You know, it's interesting. Uh, that's really exciting because as you stated, you did that last year, right? IBM made that presentation. Now last year it was a little bit different. As I stated, it was live on stage. And of course, if this were a normal year, uh, you would be doing the check presentation. You'd actually have the large check. I really felt like that was cool. The vibe would be electric. Thousands and thousands of people would be here. Now they're just online. They're still here. But, uh, but, but thank you very, very much again. Uh, so you're doing that again this year. Great news. 
And again, uh, it's great to see your commitment to open source. Again, IBM has been doing it for a long time. We know that because we've worked with you for more than a decade, but it's still great to see you continuing to do it and then to choose to do it here at All Things Open. So we're extremely grateful for that. So all that said, Brad, thank you. Indu, thank you very much. So uh, let's uh, move to the next talk. Um, the next speaker is Wendy John from Fidelity Investments. Again, this is another case where um, you know Fidelity Investments has worked very closely with us for a number of years now. They've become great partners with All Things Open. They're big supporters of the community. Um, they uh, have a large center here, a large uh, center of operations in the Research Triangle. And uh, so a large number of their uh, uh, employees and their associates and their team members actually live here in the Triangle. So I believe Wendy is coming to us live from the Triangle, right? We're in basically the same city in the same geographic area. And um, I know Wendy is gonna be joined by her colleague, Kate. Kate is going to be showing uh, some slides and Wendy's gonna be delivering her talk and talking through the slides. So what I'm gonna do is one, I'm gonna thank, um, I'm going to thank Wendy for being here. Uh, Wendy, you've been great to work with leading up to our keynote segment, our live event today. Uh, again, thank you very much for your flexibility and just for your willingness to work with us. Kate, you've been great as well. All the communication has been amazing. So I do want to thank you very, very much uh, for uh, doing all of that. So with all that said, I'm gonna yield the stage to, to them, to Wendy and to Kate. I'm gonna mute my microphone and mute my camera again. And Wendy, of course, will take over and I see that she's ready to go. So um, let's see, Brad. Um, yeah, I just wanna make sure that you've done the same as well. Our previous speaker, our prior speaker that you've, um, yeah, shut your camera and shut your microphone as well. And I'm gonna do exactly the same thing, but thank you. Again, this is live programming, right? So thanks all. Thank you, Todd. It's great to be here, everyone. So hello and good morning. My name is Wendy John, and I'm the head of global diversity and inclusion at Fidelity Investments. And my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm thrilled to be joining you today from my home in the state of North Carolina, although I'm sure we all would love to be in the convention center. But this opportunity taking it virtual allows many others who would not have been able to attend in person to join in with us. Before you think I've stumbled into the wrong Zoom webinar, I wanted to clarify that yes, you heard that right. I'm here from Fidelity Investments. You may be wondering what in the world a DNI leader from a financial services company is doing amongst the inspiring open source speakers you'll hear from this morning. And the first reason is this, we are not just a FinServe company. We also like to think of ourselves as a technology company. We spend billions annually on technology. That spend covers everything from customer platforms to tools that help us collaborate to building virtual reality experiences to help onboard new employees. Firm-wide, 25% of our employees work in technology. And in North Carolina, home to all things open, 60% of our employees are technologists. You heard me right, 60% of my fellow colleagues in North Carolina are not financial advisors, not customer service reps, but people like you who build technology. We pride ourselves on having an innovation culture built around continuous development and a growth mindset. Our employees participate in our blockchain club, join our women in technology special interest group and get involved with Fidelity Labs, our incubation lab for new ideas. We have a long history of investing in the cutting edge with recent commitments around cryptocurrency and blockchain and exciting collaborations like our quantum computing efforts with AWS. Fidelity is always creating. In fact, we hold 259 patents on a variety of topics, a great testament to our consistent focus on innovation. One area specifically around open collaboration is our work to release more of our machine learning efforts as open source. These have been focused on making common algorithms available and also for creating more simplified interfaces for frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. You'll hear more about our open source approach and efforts from my colleagues, Justin Ratcliffe and Sachin Solkan in their respective sessions at All Things Open. Okay, so now we know why Fidelity is here today, but what does inclusion and diversity have to do with technology and more specifically open source. Everyone attending today's event is on the hook for co-creating something innovative. 
You sit on teams and manage projects that create tools and platforms that improve people's lives, maybe even in ways they haven't asked for yet. The connection between diversity and inclusion, innovation and profitability has been proven. Here are a few data points to ground us all. McKinsey's 2019 analysis found that companies in the top quartile for gender diversity on executive teams were 25% more likely to have above average profitability. And this goes even further for ethnic diversity, where companies in the top quartile of ethnic diversity outperform others by 36%. And this holds true for times of uncertainty like we're in right now. Several reports showed that in 2008's global financial crisis, banks with a higher share of women on their boards were more stable than their peers. Although we all know that diversity and inclusion is important, technology and other industries like financial services remains largely white and male. Since June of this year, there's been a larger spotlight on the importance of diversity and inclusion. There's tremendous energy around these topics and how it applies in all that we do. People want to take action, but often don't know where to start. It's the same problem that has stalled this work for decades. Sometimes it just feels too big to solve. At Fidelity, we approach diversity and inclusion a little differently with a behaviors-based approach that taps into the science of habit change. We have a concept called simple starts, which prompts our employees to make adjustments to the behaviors and business processes that make up their day-to-day -day work. By focusing on behaviors within your immediate control, rather than trying to shift an entire organization's culture all at once, we see incremental changes that add up significantly over time. Our concept may be called simple starts, but there's nothing simple about the work of diversity and inclusion. It's a complicated, ingrained problem that can't be solved overnight. Getting started though can be a lot simpler with some of the ideas that I'll share with you today. I'm gonna cover a few simple starts in three distinct categories. Team management and dynamics, everyday pivots, and of course, technology. Since open source is all about coming together on collaborative teams to create and build, let's start with team, team management and dynamics. Here are a few simple behavioral changes you can implement on your teams today. Rotate work assignments on your team regularly, including team housework like note-taking or meeting scheduling and higher profile projects versus only going to the well-known few members of your team. Set team members up with mentors or sponsors with different backgrounds to expand their view of the world. Encourage participation or development of employee resource groups or ERGs. At Fidelity, we have six ERGs and four special interest groups. More than half of our employees participate in at least one of these groups and some participate in three or more. Consider starting affinity groups if your organization does not yet have them. These groups provide ready access to diverse thoughts and perspectives. They can serve as focus groups, talent pools and or business partners in your work. Audit the membership of your team. Seek participation and contribution from a diverse set of people. And when an underrepresented person leaves your team, dig into understanding the why in case there are changes that need to be made. Reconsider your team participation criteria. Balance the need for specific skills like coding, which can be taught, with the value of fresh perspectives, which might be impossible to teach. At Fidelity, we have a few programs focused on non-traditional sources of talent in technology. Fidelity Made introduces associates from traditionally non-technical roles in the enterprise to apply their business experience to tech problems. And we partner with ReachHire to provide career paths for a diversity of life situations. Now let's talk about everyday pivots. These are changes that everyone can make, regardless of their role on a team or in an organization to be more inclusive. And they span across work life and home life. It's difficult to influence one without the other. And what's the difference, especially these days? You're here with me in my home. Language matters. 
So pay careful attention to the words you use. Use pronouns in your introductions to create safety for others to share how they identify. Use more inclusive terms. For example, stop using guys as a way to refer to mixed groups of people and look for something that might be a little more gender neutral, like folks. We use that a lot here in the South of, of, of US. Capitalize the B in black in your writing when referring to black people or communities. For the open source community, eliminate te terminology like whitelist, blacklist, or master slave, and consider alternatives for other gendered language. Monitor your information diet. This means paying careful attention that the books you read, podcasts you listen to, and the shows you view aren't all created by people with the same backgrounds or perspectives. Demand a seat at the table and bring someone new along with you where or when possible. For the woman in the audience, make sure you're representing the work you've done. Don't be shy or self-deprecating when sharing your accomplishments. Overall, exposing ourselves to new thoughts, ideas, approaches, and people makes us all better. And as a result, we create better products and solutions. And last, but certainly not least, technology. The good news is that due to advancements developed by technologists like you, we, the humans, don't have to do this all on our own. Here are a few ways we can use tech to help us create more diverse and inclusive workplaces. Use artificial intelligence to audit the language and job descriptions. At Fidelity, we run our jobs through a tool that scans for biased language. It takes about six minutes per role, but has greatly improved the number of female applicants we receive. Meet diverse people where they are. Implement processes that post all of your open jobs to a variety of diverse online job boards. Remember that data isn't the end all and be all. My friend and leading AI ethicist and AI activist Renee Cummings reminded us in a recent talk at Fidelity that there's no such thing as raw data. The data points we use to build technology often comes with built-in bias because it originates from an environment where racism is systemic and stereotypes have been baked in for centuries. Ensure you're evaluating all of the components into your technology solutions for bias and engage diverse stakeholders throughout. You'll hear more from another of my colleagues, Melinda Thielbar, on our approach to AI bias and mitigation at Fidelity. Invest in places to come together online. Of course, the open source community has been practicing true online collaboration for years, for example, at the Linux Foundation. COVID-19 has exemplified the importance of creating virtual spaces for people to gather and share ideas. Ensure these online spaces are accessible and open to all using tools like live closed captioning. As I shared those three categories, doesn't it sound a lot like people, processes, and technology? a framework many of you are already familiar with. I hope that these simple starts I shared today can help you and your teams get started. If you've already started, perhaps I've given you a few new ways to continue the journey. It can be easy to let the problem paralyze you, that analysis paralysis we all know. Our country's diversity and inclusion challenges may feel too big to solve if you zoom out. So focus on zooming in and get started. Zoom in and shift from trying to change the world or your company to changing three to four behaviors on the teams where you contribute. Progress against diversity and inclusion is a lot like open source in that way. Most of us will not unveil a shiny new product or solution to the problem. This is something we will all build together, right out in the open, bringing the best of ourselves to contribute. And the first few attempts might not be perfect, but with some iteration, we can create transparent solutions that amount to real change. Thank you all for the time and enjoy the rest of this year's All Things Open. Wendy, thank you very, very much. Great job, wonderful talk, great topic. Again, it's one we focused on for a while. Thank you for working with us. Again, Fidelity Investments, wonderful partners of All Things Open. Uh, Kate, thank you very much for your work right there as well. You're right on, right on cue. You really did a great job with those slides as well. So again, um, I do wanna remind everybody, um, 
uh, that there is a day two, right? Wendy just referenced uh, Melinda, her colleague that's gonna be delivering a talk tomorrow on Tuesday on the machine learning and AI track. It's a great topic. Uh, it's regarding, I think, bias within uh, AI and machine learning. So again, the topic is great, but she is gonna be speaking tomorrow. And that, that I'll use that as an opportunity to remind you that again, this is a two day event. So by all means, please try to attend both days. So all that being said, so remember we started this morning, we went to Erica Brescia in Silicon Valley, San Francisco area on the West coast of the US. Um, and then we moved to Shedrick Akintayo that joined us from Africa. And then we went to Indu, we stayed in Africa. And then we came back to Brad Topol, uh, who was in the Research Triangle Park. And we just switched over to, transitioned to Wendy, who was also in the Triangle Park, uh, the Research Triangle Park, the RTP area of North Carolina. And now we're gonna go to uh, a speaker that is located on the West Coast of the United States, Matt Acey, uh, who serves as open source, uh, head of open source strategy and marketing at, again, Amazon Web Services. Um, I've known Matt for, uh, a while. Uh, I've read his writings for a while, right? He's a noted author, well known, uh, published widely in InfoWorld and Tech Republic. Have a lot of respect for him. Everything I've ever read has been very good. And I would say that about Matt, even if he weren't on this call and joining us today. I tell everybody, hey, you know, you want to be more educated on open source, by all means. By all means, read, read Matt's work. So I have been literally for years and years and years. So it's a pleasure to have him here. He's been a speaker at All Things Open before. Uh, he's always done a wonderful job and he's just a really nice human being. So with that, I'm gonna yield it over to, to, uh, to, to Matt. I will say this, we're running ahead just, just a bit. This is unusual. So we're running about five minutes ahead of schedule. So Matt, just so you know, you're, you're uh, actually we're about 10, 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Sorry, and I need to correct myself. So if you need a few more minutes on your talk, by all means, please feel free to take it. We're scheduled to wrap up the keynote block at 1045. It's about 1020 right now. So you do have a few extra minutes. So if you run over, please don't worry about that at all. I would also say this, if you're attending, all of our past speakers, those that spoke early are staying around and we are asking them to sort of focus on the Q and A feature. So if you have a question for them or a comment, pose those in the Q and A feature. You can do so in chat. But remember that there's a lot going on in chat. The messaging sort of stacks on top of, you know, the one that was posted previously. So things have a tendency to get lost. So please focus on Q&A. And we're asking Erica and Endu and Brad and, and Shedrick to, and, and now Wendy, to kind of focus on Q&A. So again, all means we want to encourage dialogue and interaction, but just, you know, try to, try to do it in the right way, so to speak. So with all that said, I'm going to yield this to Matt who's joining us live from Utah, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and what I'm gonna do, Matt, I'll do exactly the same thing that I've done before. I'm gonna turn my microphone off and stop my video and you will begin to share yours and then you'll share your screen. So with that, I yield the virtual stage to you, my friend. Awesome, thank you, Todd. And this will take me a second. Good thing that we have a few extra minutes because uh, as with any meeting in technology, it should always start with some technical difficulties. So um, to start with, let's, uh, let me share my screen. Ah, there we go. And let's go. So I'm first of all, very grateful for Todd. I have, I think it might've been 2007 was my first year uh, presenting at what was then called uh, POSCON and has since become all things open. Todd has been very gracious in the past of asking for my, uh, my opinion on things as to what he should do to make this event even better. And um, Fortunately, he has not heeded any of my suggestions, which is why All Things Open is as fantastic as it is today, and he's just done a, an amazing job. I want to talk a little bit and appreciate Todd and the other speakers that we've had so far. I want to talk a little bit about open source in the cloud, which has been a contentious issue in the, in the past. Um, but in the spirit of the people who have already spoken, I don't want to talk about it from a contentious angle. I want to talk about it in the spirit of partnership. But I'm going to start with something that might sound a little contentious. And that is in a conversation that I had not too long ago with a, a colleague of mine, Matt Wilson, he made the observation that most enterprise software is garbage. Um, he might not have used the word garbage, but he said, 
we talked about why enterprise software is so incredibly bad. And his suggestion was that the reason for that ultimately comes down to the fact that the vendors of the software are not the ultimate users of the software. And the closer we could get, and this goes back to something that uh, now IBM president, then uh, Red Hat CEO, Jim Whitehurst said back in 2009, which was, we have so much waste in, in the software industry. We really need end users. There's not a great word for that, but let's say end users or customers, um, also not a great way of expressing it, but end users of software, we need more end users of software contributing to open source so that instead of reinventing the wheel, we can collaborate. So that's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna to talk about how we get there and how we bring down the wall between um, open source and cloud because there's been this myth that's surfaced over the last few years. And that is that in some way, cloud and open source are in contention, are in conflict. And I would argue the opposite is true. Uh, recently in a new stack series that, that I wrote, uh, and I got so much great feedback from people on Twitter and, uh, and quote unquote in real life um, that said, the cloud would not be possible without open source. And I think that's true. I think it might've been Erica who started this uh, day off, who said it really, I mean, it, it, part of it comes down to economics, but it's not really a matter of economics. It's really a matter of how, how would you count up all the licenses if you're thinking of thousands or tens of thousands or millions of servers? How do you do that? With open source, you don't really have to think about that. With traditional, enterprise software, proprietary software, he did. And it makes it such that the cloud would be, if not impossible, and I would argue impossible, at least extraordinarily difficult. And Chris DeBona, who I think is speaking tomorrow, made that contention years ago that Google would not be possible without open source. So we know that the cloud enables, or that open source enables the cloud. But I want to talk a little bit about how the cloud is enabling open source. So, and, and as part of that, a good friend of mine, Sam Ramji, who's now chief strategy officer at Datastax, used to be the open source guy back when that was a thing at Microsoft, but that was a long time ago. Now open source is uh, everybody's thing at, at Microsoft. Um, Sam likes to say, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. It's not his saying, but he says it a lot. So I want to talk about that. And I'm also going to talk about Pi, in part because at that first PostCon, All Things Open that I spoke at, Todd, uh, Todd fed us all because that Todd's like that. It's that Southern hospitality, um, but also because I like to bake Pi. So we're going to talk a little bit about Pi. When you think of the biggest contributors to open source, I'd be interested, and we can't take a, a poll here and ask everybody, but I'd be interested who you think of when you, when you think of that. When I say the biggest contributor that you can think of to open source, put it, keep it in your mind. I'm pretty sure you're thinking of a cloud vendor right now. And if you are, you, if you're playing your odds of the top 10 uh, open source contributors, seven of those top 10 are cloud vendors. And I use the term cloud um, a little bit loosely. I shouldn't say vendors, I should say cloud companies because in that number is Facebook, for example. In that, in that group is Amazon. In that group is Google, Microsoft, Red Hat slash IBM. Um, but also other companies, there are a few other companies that don't fit that cloud label like uh, Intel, for example, but Intel does a fair amount to enable the cloud with, with chips and other so in software. But think about that. Why would that be that the vast majority, if you, if you tally up the biggest contributors in terms of raw contributors um, to open source, why would they be cloud companies? And I think it's, I think it, if you, if you step back for, for a second, it's a little bit obvious why that would be the case. It's because cloud companies, don't really have anything to lose by contributing software. They don't sell software. Facebook doesn't sell software. AWS or Amazon doesn't sell software. They sell services. 
So the software itself can be given away. And if we look again at the, at the things that have come out of the different cloud companies, amazing software like Kubernetes that came out of Google. Um, th this is the sort of thing that the cloud enables because it takes away the competitive uh, need to keep software proprietary. So if you, if you run um, some sort of calculus as to contributes equals to benefits, well, it also makes sense that the cloud companies would be big contributors uh, because we're benefiting a great deal from open source. And I wanna talk about that. But really, I wanna get away a bit from talking about the big companies behind open source. And I wanna talk about the people behind open source and how people are making software, open source software better in the cloud. And the first person I wanna to talk to about is Dries Beitert, a, a friend of mine who uh, much more importantly, well, much more importantly to you um, as to why he's important, he's the founder of Drupal. But that's not how Dries started. When he started Drupal, he didn't start Drupal. He was looking for a way to share a, a quote unquote high speed ADSL internet connection as a student in Belgium. And he and his friends were just looking for to build a bulletin board. Well, that little bulletin board evolved into Drupal, which last year or for the last major release had 10,000 different contributors to the project. It's an amazing example of open source success. But getting from Dries and his friends to Dries and 10,000 of his friends, and by the way, Dries, so he started a company called Acquia and Acquia, despite being the largest single contributor to, to Drupal, accounted uh, for less than 5% of those total contributions to the last release. So how did he get from one person to 10,000? Well, along the way in 2000, um, Dries in a conversation that I had with him, he said in 2000, it was a, they were really struggling to scale Drupal. And part of that was MySQL. MySQL is a great open source database, but he was struggling with all the, as he said, the hundreds of knobs that he had to fiddle with to get it to scale. Circa 2006, AWS launches, and suddenly that he's, in his words, that became dramatically easier. And he says, you have no idea the change that it made for Drupal in enabling them to scale it. So on the one hand, thinking about cloud, one thing that cloud does is that it makes it so that individual open source entrepreneurs, and an entrepreneur, I don't mean that they necessarily start a business, I just mean that they start a project. An open source entrepreneur finds it dramatically easier to start and scale their project. It's one thing that the cloud does. Another example, a more recent example, is Matt Klein with Envoy. Envoy is this fantastic open source project that Matt started as, um, as an engineer at Lyft. In Matt's words, when he, when he uh, started the Envoy, it started off just as an, init, an, in, an internal project. They were trying to move from a monolithic, uh, a monolith based architecture to a microservices based architecture. And so uh, they, he and, and his team created Envoy. Great. But then they decided, well, maybe we should open source this. And in Matt's words, he did this in part because he thought it'd be good for his career. Lyft did it in part because they thought it'd be great for recruiting, but it was an example of an, of an individual uh, person, uh, Matt, deciding that he wanted to open source this thing and then taking it out. Now, it's become this great service mesh that uh, a lot of different people use, but it started as him scratching an itch for Lyft. And it, and thinking about it in terms of we're seeing, again, coming back to that idea of the best software will emerge from those who use the software. In Dries's case, it was Dries starting it to, to share um, internet access at, at a university in Belgium. In Matt's case, it was him sharing the software that would enable um, Lyft to get a higher return on their investment in Envoy. Uh, but they built it to, to support cloud native applications at, at uh, Lyft. Um, 
incidentally, I asked Matt recently, why don't we see more user-driven open source and user-driven open source? And I, I try not to swear, so I won't quote him verbatim, but he said, it's because it's so effing hard. Um, and he said, but for my naivete, I never would have done this, but we're grateful that he did. And now today he's, we have this great open source project. And by the way, um, if you look at the contributors to it, at least 40%, roughly 40% of that code to contributed to Envoy is coming from Google. And so we see the cloud contributing back to, uh, to what it's created. I'm gonna to go to one more example. And this is uh, Madeline Olson, and it's the story of Redis, but that story starts not with Madeline, it starts with Salvatore Sanfilippo, who was the founder of, of Redis. And when Salvatore started uh, Redis, he did it, it, this also has another MySQL angle. He did it not because um, he really wanted to start to uh, build a new database. He had no experience with database. He says, I had no idea what I was getting into. I broke all the rules on, on database design. Uh, no one really would take an in-memory database seriously at the time, but he did it anyway, and he started it. One thing that it didn't have was encryption built in. So Madeline is an engineer on the Elasticash team at, at AWS. And I think roughly two years ago, she and her manager decided, hey, you know what? We depend in significant part on Redis. We should contribute back. Well, you don't just walk into Mordor and you don't just walk into an open source project and take over as take over that project. So Madeline started small. And in her words, she continued to be a relatively small contributor. She did things like enable greater communication by starting a Slack channel uh, for Redis contributors. She did other things like um, preparing other people's contributions to make it, help them pass muster with Salvatore. And she did one thing that she didn't get actually her code uh, accepted by Salvatore, but she came up with the idea of how to get encryption built into Redis. And uh, Yossi Gottlieb, one of the contributors, and Salvatore reviewed it, said, decided that they didn't want to take that, her code, but liked the approach. And so they used that approach and built their own code. But it was little contributions like that that earned her goodwill with the team. And then recently, when Redis decided, or the, the Redis, uh, Salvatore decided to leave Redis to go pursue other things, they came up with a new governance structure and Madeline was asked to be one of the five maintainers along with uh, three folks from Redis Labs and Zhao Zhao from Alibaba. It's a great story of how an individual working at a cloud company because it was solving a, a particular cloud companies or scratching our itch, how she went from a small contributor to now a significant maintainer. But I think it also says a great deal about how open source can work in the cloud. So here you start with Salvatore, who by the way, I wish I looked like Salvatore, these rugged good looks, kind of looks like uh, Michael Hutchins, um, the uh, former uh, vo lead vocalist for NXS. Salvatore, if you're listening, man crush on you. The, but you look at what it went from Salvatore to Redis Labs starting um, to help fund the development of of Redis to where we are today with Redis Labs continuing to, to fund a significant amount of the development around Redis, but also a number of cloud vendors building managed Redis services around Redis. It's a fantastic example. And you say, well, surely this has cratered Redis Labs revenue. I don't, I'm not privy to their to their numbers, and I wouldn't divulge them if I were. But in my conversations with them, and they're a great partner of, of AWS, they're doing really, really well. It turns out that sharing code and sharing and growing a Pi is a good strategy. So let's talk about Pi, because like I said, I really like Pi and bake a lot of Pi. And let's do some Pi related math. So Gardner said that in um, 2020, even with COVID, Global IT spending should top about $3.9 trillion, a lot of money. Cloud, and we spend a lot of time talking about cloud and like figuring out who's winning in the cloud wars. 
well, it's a relatively small piece of that overall pie, 266 billion. It's, it's significant money, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a really small pie. I was an English major and so I'm not necessarily great at math, but I think what that means is that when we spend time agonizing and fighting over who's winning in the cloud and who's uh, is cloud chewing into open source, et cetera, we're talking, we're fighting over 6% of that global IT spend, which is a little ridiculous. Now we could say that, well, you know, we've been conditioned to think about um, in this way of we're conditioned to think about small pie. Martin Mikos is a good friend and about 15 years ago when he was CEO of MySQL, he's now CEO of HackerOne, but when he was CEO of, of MySQL and he came up with this great quote saying for in open source, he wanted to take a big market, make it smaller and then take a big chunk of that market. And we're kind of used to thinking about um, when we talk about open source that like saving money and we're, we talk about cloud, we talk about it in the same way. And so we end up with this little small pie. It's a cute pie. That's my um, strawberries and cream pie that I like to make, but it's a small pie and I like pie. So I don't really want small pie. So I had this conversation with Simon Wardley. Many of you have uh, know Simon and, and I think he's, uh, I'm sure he's spoken here before. In fact, I think I've heard him speak at all things open before. He introduced me to this idea of Jevons paradox. And in a nutshell, that idea is we normally think that when we save money, when unit costs go down, that the overall pie is going to shrink, that the market will shrink because people will spend less money because they'll pocket those savings and move on. Turns out that's not how things work in real life. When we save money on, um, on, our cloud spend because of our cloud spend, we spend we end up spending more. When we save more by moving to Postgres, um, we end up spending more on databases or on or, or on other services around it. So, the way that I read that is that instead of instead of the lower unit costs that cloud and open source together bring us, instead of that turning into less pie turns into more. The pie isn't shrinking, it's getting bigger. And by the way, that applies too to the open source companies. I saw just last week that uh, uh, Databricks, they, I think, I think they actually announced this, that they are now on a $350 million run rate selling managed uh, Spark and, and other open source software. Well, guess what? Databricks has healthy competition from, from my company and, for, and from others. And they're doing great in part because a variety of contributors are growing that pie. Look at MongoDB doing phenomenally well. I think roughly 500 million in revenue now, almost half of which getting close to half of which comes from their cloud service Atlas, which is fantastic. And you go down the list, Confluent uh, recently, well, last year, raised money on a huge valuation, doing really, really well in terms of revenue. Um, Elastic, the same thing, Redis Labs, Datastacks, HashiCorp, all these open source companies doing really well. And I would argue they're doing really well precisely because they've embraced cloud. And early on, we had some friction because uh, uh, over licensing gymnastics, but I think that was just a moment in time. I think it was just, it, it gave us time until we got to the point where we realized the cloud is not competitive to open source. It's an enabler for open source. It makes it so that end users can focus more time on getting work done rather than on doing the undifferentiated heavy lifting of setting up and, and managing infrastructure. It's a really good thing what we have now. I want to end with um, somebody who I think is extraordinarily smart, Adam Jacob. He was the co-founder and CTO at Chef and, uh, and now the co-founder of System Initiative. And he talks about cloud and open source in this way. He says, you can think of it as competitive 
or you can think of it as a way of growing that overall, um, the top of funnel, or again, in my words, uh, growing the pie. And I remember having this conversation with a friend um, that I had worked with when I was at MongoDB. And uh, we were at reInvent, AWS reInvent, back when we were able to go and talk to people in person. And it just struck me at that time that we, those two companies, but in general, we were wasting a lot of time fighting over relatively small pieces of pie. And that it would be much better for each of us to go out and build that pie, contribute to that upstream um, open source project. And we've seen that at my company, we've seen that with um, most recently with Redis, but also GraphQL and, and a number of other projects. And if you look across those cloud companies, people are doing, I think, a, a pretty good job of doing that. We've, we've had to figure it out over time, but my sense is that there's this great opportunity for all of us to build these open source pies, open source communities together. We need to be a little bit patient with each other. There's, it's easy to make, make accusations and assume that we know what other people are thinking. We assume we know why they do the things that, that, that they do, whether on an individual level or on a um, macro level, on a company level. I just ask that we be a little bit more thoughtful of each other and that we remember open source is ultimately about community. It's ultimately about people. It's ultimately about enabling those people. And as we do that, we do something that makes me really happy. And that is we grow the open source pie. Thank you very much. And Todd, again, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Great job as always. We wanted to, uh, again, we're really happy and thankful for you to present that topic. It's one that's, it's influencing everyone. You know, it's having a big impact. And as I said, when we first got this block started, in our keynotes, we try to feature speakers and topics that are widely impactful, that are, again, having an influence on people and on open source in general. So that topic is certainly having an impact. And uh, again, we very much wanted your perspective on that and to deliver the topic and make that available as part of the block. So thank you very much. And thanks for getting up early too. I know I've thanked, I think both of our speakers from the West Coast. I know you got up early to join us today. So we, again, we don't take that for granted. It's Monday morning. Uh, and I know schedules have changed with everyone going virtual and working from home and things like that. But at the end of the day, the facts remain the same. You've gotten up early to join us. So we very much appreciate that. Matt, again, great job. And thank you for doing that. So uh, we're running about just a couple minutes ahead. So what I'm going to do is take these uh, two minutes just to run over some announcements again before we break and, and act officially end the keynote block and day one keynote segment. So I want to thank all of our keynote speakers. Uh, they did a wonderful job. They were strategically chosen based on the topic and who they were and their perspective from which they were delivering the topics. I think everyone did an amazing job. And again, they were gracious enough to join us from all over the world live. Uh, again, uh, Erica joined us and I think she's still active in chat and she's responding to comments and to questions. And thank you very much for doing that. So GitHub, obviously an integral player in the open source space, can't be much more integral than GitHub. So as COO, you play a very prominent role and uh, again, you have a lot of influence. So the fact that you took the time to join us, we very much appreciate that. Shedrick, thank you very much for joining us from, from uh, Africa again. Open source in Africa is a fascinating topic and we're, we're excited to watch it grow and we're excited to watch it evolve and where it goes into the future. IBM, thank you again. Uh, Indu and Brad, we really appreciate you being with us today. And again, uh, it's been exciting to watch in, uh, IBM's contributions grow over time. They've been doing it for a long time. We're just glad that they're finally uh, in our opinion, letting the public know about what they've been doing for a long time. And uh, again, we've worked together for more than a decade. So I greatly appreciate your all's partnership. Wendy and Kate from Fidelity Investments, again, another partner with ATO. You're doing amazing work. The talk was great. And we greatly appreciate you joining us from the Research Triangle. And then finally, Matt, again, uh, you just spoke, just wrapped up your talk, I know, but I do want to thank you again. Also want to thank our sponsors. Uh, without our sponsors, none of this would be possible. I do want to encourage you, everyone's still on, 
this session and still watching, uh, thank you for staying through to the end, number one, but also um, on the break, when we break here in another one to two minutes, if you would uh, maybe navigate over to the virtual exhibit hall and talk to some of our sponsors there. I think every, I think we have 50 sponsors, 50 partners, sponsors and partners and nonprofits and, and people with booths, exhibit booths in the exhibit area. Uh, they're all uh, staff live. So you're gonna talk to live human beings and I would encourage you to navigate over and you know, learn more about them and learn more about their contribution to and support of uh, open source in general. They're all making great contributions. And the fact that they've supported this event, by extension, they're supporting the open source community. So we could not be more grateful for that. And again, all of our speakers, our keynote speakers here, and then our speakers to come uh, for the remainder of the day and tomorrow. Again, you are the show, you're the content, you're why people show up and register for the event. So thank you. Also, um, the next block starts here in about uh, about 15 minutes at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time or EDT. I know we have a lot of people joining us from different time zones, so that would be a different time for you. But here in about 15 minutes is when our first breakout session block will begin. So keep that in mind, take a look at the schedule and you can, take, uh, you can access the schedule at the help desk. And you can also um, you know, navigate back to the ATO website and the web-based schedule is available there as well. The PDFs are available within the help desk area. You can download those and take a look at the schedule and uh, see what you might want to attend. Chances are you already know what, what session you're going to and what track it's on. Uh, you've probably already taken a look at that, but if you haven't, please do that. The leaderboard, just a quick reminder, is that you are accumulating points while you're on the site based on your activity. This is something fun we try to do. We've never done this before. Frankly, we've never been able to. The virtual environment enables us to do this. So we wanted to do something fun and uh, maybe you know gamify this a little bit. We're giving away some amazing prizes. And what we're gonna do, just so you know, and I know I mentioned this before, is that um, we're gonna do day one and day two. So at the end of day one, at the close of business today, once we wrap up content, we're gonna refresh or reset the leaderboard and then we'll start it back up uh, first thing tomorrow morning as soon as, as soon as programming begins at 8.45 tomorrow Eastern time. Uh, so uh, we're gonna identify the winners of the leaderboard tomorrow morning, the winner, you know, today's winners tomorrow morning. And uh, again, the prizes are amazing. You can learn more about the leaderboard at the help desk. I think there's a big icon you can click on and then you can view a PDF that'll tell you more. Um, again, the help desk, we, we're live at the help desk. Uh, in addition, Six Connects, our virtual platform partner, they're live as well. So they have technical support available there. They've dedicated a technician to us. So if you have an issue with the platform or a question, you know, go over to the help desk and don't hesitate to post the question. And if we don't answer it immediately, please don't hold that against us, but we'll elevate it and we'll make sure that we triage that and we get the answers for you. I promise we'll, we'll move as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, the keynote speakers in this block tomorrow, again, this is a two day event. The lineup tomorrow is absolutely amazing. So be sure to come back. We've got Angie Jones. Most of you know Angie from Apple Tools. She'll be our first keynote speaker tomorrow morning. She's an amazing speaker. She's a multi-time speaker here at All Things Open. And I think she has a connection to the Research Triangle Park. I think she used to live here and work. Her home base was the RTP. Uh, Martin Mikos, Matt just mentioned uh, Martin from Hacker One. Martin is, gonna, is our second speaker. He's gonna talk about security. Obviously security impacts everyone. That's the second speaker in the sequence tomorrow morning. And then Sarah Drasner. Uh, Sarah needs no introduction. Uh, most of you in the dev world know Sarah. She's now with Net Netlify, Netlify, sorry, and uh, she does an amazing job. She's uh, uh, she really does a, a, amazing work. Again, most of you probably know Sarah. She's our third speaker in the sequence tomorrow. And then Chris DeBona. Uh, Chris is head of open source or leads the open source uh, effort at Google. He's been active in the space for a long time. He's such a good person. I'm going to tell a story about Chris tomorrow. Uh, and he may not remember this. He, he doesn't know I'm going to do this. So, I, you know, I don't mean to spring this on him, but he's such a good human being and such a nice person. Uh, I had an encounter with uh, Chris a, really a decade ago or thereabouts, and uh, which showed me just what a really nice person he is. And I, I'll, I'll tell you that story tomorrow. But anyway, that's our keynote lineup for tomorrow morning. I'll end with this. Uh, I am in, uh, you can see behind me, we wanted to replicate uh, the environment, you know, the real life environment, what we would otherwise be doing if it weren't for COVID as much as we can. We chose to go live with our programming. That was a risk, right? Live programming is always a challenge and always a risk, but we thought you were worth it. You're worth the investment and you're worth the risk. We wanted to, in some small way, return some sense of normalcy to life. I know that life for everyone has been changed forever, probably, uh, but I know I certainly long for kind of the normal and uh, what, what used to be. So we tried to replicate that for you. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. 
Uh, I wish, how I wish this had three to 4,000 people in it live right now, and I was speaking to you live. I will say this, we're gonna make every effort to come back live in 2021. Uh, we've already saved our dates. We'll release those right after this event. So um, again, we're, we're gonna make every effort to return to normal and be in person. Would you consider, we would ask for your consideration, consider joining us next year live here in Raleigh. And uh, if not, we will, and if you can't make it, we're gonna make every attempt to have a virtual element to the conference next year, regardless of what the final format might be. But we'd love to see you. We'd love to maybe give you a fist bump. We might not be able to shake your hand anymore uh, or give you, you know, a friendly hug but we'll certainly make you feel at home and be as nice to you as we possibly can. We want you to feel at home with us. So thanks for joining the community. Thank you for joining us here in the keynote block. Hope you've enjoyed it. Now uh, go uh, to the virtual exhibit hall, go to the networking lounge, meet other attendees, or just navigate around the space and get to your next talk. All the tracks are open, I believe, and you should know at this point, or you will soon, what, talk, what track your actual talk, the next talk that you're going to is on. They're open, so you can access the links and you should be able to gain access. And then you'll just wait for the next talk to start at the scheduled time, which again is 11 uh, Eastern Daylight Time, EDT uh, here on the East Coast, uh, which is about 10 minutes. But thank you very much. So we'll go ahead and sign off live for now. We'll see you uh, again at the next block beginning in about 10 minutes. And then we'll see you live uh, at the end of the day today. So stay around. We'll be right back on this stage live as we close things down around 5.30 or 6, whatever time the last, uh, uh, the last breakout session ends, but we'll be right back here. We'll do some giveaways and some things like that. Those of you familiar know, we begin together and we always end together. Again, we're a community, we're family. We start the day out together and we end together and we'll certainly do that today. So for now, thank you. All of our keynote speakers, thank you for staying around. Thank you for joining. We truly, truly appreciate it. Wonderful job today. So thank you again one last time. Bye-bye.